I'm going to spend the bulk of our time there, right in the middle of the sermon, probably. Anybody who's familiar with, the, uh, with Christianity at all knows that it has something to do with this man named Jesus, and he died for our sins, and then he came back from the dead. What, uh, sometimes, sometimes when I preach a sermon, I think to myself, did I really offer anything at all? I mean, it's, I feel like all I did was just open the book, and then I just read, and I just read it slowly so that we have to think about it for a second. But I think, um, I truly do think that actually there is a real value in that because um, there are plenty of people who are ignorant of truth, but on the other side of that, there's plenty of people who are so familiar with truth that you're like those who grew up around Jesus your whole life in Nazareth. So when Jesus comes back home, it's like you get offended at him, and they can't, he can't do any miracles there because they're just so cynical toward him, um, if you're familiar with that story. Uh, but the point is that you can become so familiar with the truth that, you, uh, that it goes underappreciated. And so uh, I think that it is important, and that's why I have you go to Matthew 27, that we're going to read the basically the whole story of Jesus' resurrection. Um, but on the one hand, as I preach this, you'll recognize that this is very basic. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, hopefully you'll see afresh how revolutionary it is and how central it is to our faith and what we stake all of our whole entire life and truly our eternity on. In Hebrews chapter 6, like I said, I won't start in Matthew 27, but we'll get there. Um, let's see if this will work today. There we go. Resurrection. We'll see that the resurrection is, number one, real, and secondly, that it's relevant. That's really the outline of my sermon today. First question is, is resurrection real? Oh, I hate that. I wish it would just go one bullet at a time, but that's okay. There's my whole sermon right there. <laughs> is resurrection real? Here I'm not asking the question, is Jesus' resurrection real? Here I'm asking the question, if resurrection itself is real. The idea that somebody could stop breathing and then at some point later, whether it be a day or two, months, years, or decades, or millennia, breathe again, have a body again. That's what we're asking. Hebrews chapter 6 says not only uh, is this idea and concept of resurrection real, but it's very, very basic, as I mentioned in my opening. There he's chiding his audience and telling them, you guys should be able to have these basic truths, you know, under your belt and sort of understood, not forgotten, but understood and have a good grasp on it so that you can move on and, I can, and he can build upon that, that basic foundation. But he lists a group of things that are foundational. He says this. He says, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. So what, what's about to follow are considered elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation. There's the word. This is that all, everything that follows here is going to be foundational. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, which, side note, if you don't realize that repentance from acts not, uh, that lead to death, repentance from acts that lead to death, if that's not kind of a given to you when it comes to thinking about your Christian faith, then you don't, you're missing a foundational part of Christianity. Repentance of acts that lead to death. That's one of the things he says is foundational. Then he goes on to mention the next thing that's foundational and just basic and elementary. Those are his words, foundational and elementary. Repentance from acts that lead to death. Secondly, of faith in God. So the side note here is if you don't realize that having faith in God is elementary and foundational to the Christian faith, you don't have the Christian faith. Here's another one. Instruction about cleansing rites. This would have to do sort of with a development from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Baptism would be included in that. The laying on of hands. And then this is what we're really looking at. It says the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Two things that, you know, people are familiar with, but maybe don't focus centrally and directly on. The resurrection of the dead, and that's where our focus is for today. But the writer of uh, 
Hebrews says that the resurrection of the dead, just the idea, he doesn't specify there the resurrection of Jesus or the resurrection of other people, but simply the resurrection of the dead is a number one elementary, number two foundational teaching of the Christian faith. It's, it's central. It's indispensable. But the idea of resurrection has always been doubted. I have, as you have, probably heard of lots of different sermons about the resurrection of Jesus, and a lot of times what will be talked about is evidences for the fact that he rose from the dead. And the reason why we do that is because we understand that we live in a skeptical age that is predicated on science, which seems to suggest that we live in a materialistic world, which means that what you see, feel, hear, touch, smell, those are the things that exist and nothing else. And in a world like that, how can someone die, be terminated, and then come back to life? And so then we have to sort of explain and evidence our way and reason our way to the possibility of this happening. But the fact is that the skepticism that surrounds the idea of resurrection is not new to the scientific age. It's not new to this data-driven age where we think we have it all figured out. Skepticism of the resurrection has always been around. A couple examples. Here's in Acts chapter 17, 32. This is, remember, this is the first generation of evangelists, of apostles really, that go that have seen Jesus and are now going out to tell people about Jesus. And this is what one of the experiences that Paul, who's an apostle, has. As he's preaching, at the very end of his sermon in verse 31, he says this, For he has set a day, meaning God, has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by a man he has appointed. He has given proof to this, uh, uh, of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So now he mentions Jesus' resurrection. And what's the response of the crowd? It says this in verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, now listen, they had listened to uh, a long sermon here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Paul had laid out a lot up to this point. But it wasn't until they heard the resurrection of the dead, it says some of them sneered. Some of them sneered. They snickered, there was scorn, there was, you know, maybe sort of a suspicious eye uh, uh, toward Paul in this message. It was, it was, he's preaching in Athens here, and it would have been idiotic. It would have been sort of goofy or silly, you know, just whimsical to think that a man could resur res resurrect from the dead. It says, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So we see a bit of skepticism there in Athens. In Athens, there were, I mentioned so these were two major philosophies of the time. Stoicism, which maybe had... Stoicism was uh, a philosophy that was the idea of the fact that you need to control everything. You can control and nothing else. That was basically sort of a, a gross uh, summation or reductionist this way, re reductionistic way of explaining what Stoicism was. But in regards to religion, they were pantheistic, meaning that that nature and the, and the world itself was God, that they were one and the same. And so with this type of understanding, when somebody died, the idea was, well, they're just, there, there is no separation of like a God and then his creation. It's just, you were, it was just all one thing. It was all one unit. It was a soul world. And so when somebody died, they just basically were sort of absorbed into that soul world. The other sort of competing or rival philosophy of the time was Epicurean philosophy, which was, people point to that as the uh, predecessor to nowadays materialism. Their idea was that, well, maybe, maybe they were atheistic, but more likely they weren't atheistic. It's just that they saw everything as just small particles and atoms, and so when somebody died, they just went back to being these small atoms. They just sort of broke apart. And maybe these atoms constituted some sort of pantheon of gods or something. But the idea was they didn't have any place for resurrection either. Even though these were two rival philosophies, they both agreed on the fact that there can't be a resurrection after the dead. And this is the group of people that Paul would have been speaking to, and this was the type of mindset they would have had when they heard Paul speak about a resurrection of the dead. They would have looked at him and said, this is foreign, and this is, uh, we don't know if we can accept this idea of a man rising from the dead. Jesus himself uh, came across some skepticism about the resurrection when some people came to him and asked him, 
a question that wasn't a genuine question. It was a question meant to trip him up. It was just something to, tr to try to stump him. I think we can all relate to that. Have you ever had your kids ask you a question that they don't want the answer to? They're just try trying to prove a point. They're trying to shut you up somehow, They're trying to stick it to you. Um, we always win those arguments, don't we? Yeah, we do. So uh, Mark 12, 18, it says, The Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection... They say that there's no resurrection. So again, the only point I'm making here is that there's always been skepticism about the idea of resurrection. That's not new to the 19, you know, 1900s and 2000s. These Sadducees, they believe that there was no resurrection. And then they go on to ask him a question about what's going to happen at the resurrection, which goes to show their, their disingenuousness. In the question, they're going to ask a question predicated on something that they don't believe in in the first place. So they're just trying to trip Jesus up and tie him up in knots. I will skip over that just to get to our point about resurrection for today. Jesus answers the question, which has to do with marriage and the resurrection. And then after he is done addressing that, he, he says, by the way, in regards to the dead rising, this is verse 26. He says, now, about the dead rising. See, he's answered the one question. Now he says, now let's move on to, let me tell you about the dead rising. Here's what he says. Have you not read in the book of Moses? Now, what's interesting about this is the reason why the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection is because they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They only believed Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They believed that was God's word, and all the prophetic writings beyond that maybe had their place, but they were kind of apocryphal, which means sort of... Uh, you could just say like an addendum to the Bible. Maybe important, but not inspired to the authority of the first five books of the Bible. So from that, you, if you've ever read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, where in there does it teach the resurrection of the dead? Well, the Sadducees would say it doesn't. That's why they didn't believe. They believed God's word, but it was only those first five books, according to them. And in those five books, you couldn't find resurrection. So it's, inter it's interesting that Jesus actually goes to one of those five books of the Bible in order to make his point. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, where's that at? You ought to know this. Somebody ought to know this. <laughs> Exodus, because we've been going through it for the last few months, right? In the book of Exodus, so this is right squarely and where they will, you know, address or acknowledge this as God's word. He says, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. It's always interesting to me to see the way Jesus handles the Old Testament because it's informative or it's instructive in how we can read the Old Testament. I can't say that I've read the story in Exodus and saw that God called himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and saw that as a defense for the fact that he's the God of the living. I always thought that he was just hearkening back to the reminder of, you know, kind of making a, 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 a connection of continuation from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's era up to Moses' era. And that's there, yeah. But the point that Jesus is making here is that God was not, was not formerly the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but that God was the God of Abraham, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even as he's speaking to Moses, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are currently alive. They're still conscious. There's still, they're still a, uh, 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 a, a, a consciousness of their soul, but, but, but more so there will be a resurrection that comes uh, where they will fully be alive in him. And, and, and God is the God. Is, God is that type of God, a God who would, um, who would pledge himself to a people that would live with him eventually, eternally, not just in their lifetime. So we see in, uh, in this story that there's another group of people that doubt the resurrection, the idea of resurrection in general. That's the Sadducees. And my last example is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. We could see that there were uh, not just um, individuals out there in Athens or individuals... Um, in Jesus' ministry, but even as the church was established. 1 Corinthians 15, remember this is written to a church. There were a group of people, apparently, that had doubted or were wondering about whether there even was a resurrection at all. So it says this in verse 33, actually. 
Paul tells them, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So that's, that speaks to me that there must have been some contingency within this church that maybe was a corrupting influence into the church and spreading this idea or this notion that maybe resurrection has already happened or maybe it never existed at all in the first place. So he warns them, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Verse 34, come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. The this is the way he speaks. Now, he speaks in really harsh terms toward those who would doubt this as a res- resurrection at all. And he does that in such a way, or he does that for the purpose of warning those who maybe have not committed to that idea that there's no resurrection, but maybe are starting to be sort of charmed by that idea. Like, yeah, that's maybe, maybe there's not a resurrection. And he warns them. He says, don't be misled. Don't be misled. He says, uh, There are some, which is referring to those who would doubt the resurrection, who are ignorant of God, who are ignorant of God. That's that's kind of offensive, you know. I mean, when you're speaking of people who are in the church, could you imagine somebody saying that they don't you don't even know God because of your stance on something? I mean, specifically the resurrection. If somebody in this church said that they doubted there's a resurrection at all, I think I'd be within uh, you know, within the boundaries here of what Uh, Paul said to the Corinthians, and also what Jesus said to those Sadducees, he told them that they were badly mistaken. I'd be well within my parameters to say, listen, you you don't even know the Bible. You're ignorant of the Bible, and you're ignorant of the power of God if you think that God can't resurrect people from the dead. Now, not only was uh, resurrection always a phenomenon that is understandably sort of doubted or questioned. It's not something that's expected, and so therefore skepticism was uh, all over the place and always has been. Well, we can see that it, it, it is the story itself. When we talk about the gospel message, we see that the resurrection is an inseparable part of it, obviously. So I read on Friday, obviously, the story of Jesus' betrayal and arrest, his trial, and his death, but then we stopped there. Even though we knew that wasn't the end of the story, that was the end of the story for that day because our purposes on Friday were to see what had happened when Jesus was murdered. But today, we, I'm going to read through the rest of the story of him coming back to life. And so this starts in chapter 27 of Matthew, which you should be at by now, verses 62, and then we'll go all the way through the end of the book. So Matthew 27, 62, this is God's word. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Which is awesome because that goes to show it wasn't like a private expectation that was just among the disciples. But even people that didn't follow Jesus happened to know that there was this rumor that they were going to try to pull off some trick to make it look like he was raised from the dead. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. So they want extra security to make sure that there's no doubt that, or that there's no way that anybody could come in there and steal the body. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. In a world full of conspiracy theories, it's interesting to see that even back then they were um, trying to fight against a possible conspiracy theory, (laughs) or possible conspiracy. This last deception or conspiracy, (laughs) his last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate answered, take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So take some men, and then take your ingenuity and do what you can to make sure that this thing cannot be broken into. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. From what I read, this would have been attached by rope and would have been basically a clay sort of uh, uh, pressed, some clay pressed upon with an insignia of the Roman Empire that basically said that if this is broken, this is like, this is like slapping Caesar right in the face. I mean, you, you're bringing down the wrath of the whole empire if, uh, upon yourself if you were to break this seal and, and enter beyond this point. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. And just as those uh, Roman soldiers in them, or the Jesus' accusers had said he might do as well. <laughs> Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. I love that mixture. Afraid yet filled with joy. I mean, that is so realistic. That is what the response would be, right? I mean, you're not going to be nonchalant and think, yeah, I knew he was going to come back. <laughs> you would, even if you thought that, even if you were hopeful. I mean, if you were one of the few women who stayed there and watched Jesus die and, and, and maybe had thought, you know, Jesus, you knew about this idea that maybe he'd come back from the dead, but we know he can't come back from the dead, but maybe he could, but you know he can't. But, you know, so you're kind of hopeful, but, uh, but still, still shocked when it actually happened. Afraid, yet filled with joy. Their master is alive. The one that they love, the one, more importantly, who had loved them, is still alive. He's alive again. They ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Man, I wish I could show you a video. I just wasn't prepared to. I, I, I thought about it, and I... Truth be told, I just forgot because I probably would have decided to. But I watched a, uh, a, a reel on Instagram. Uh, every once in a while, you watch something good, right? <laughs> it, was, it was incredibly powerful. It was um, nine, something like nine possible responses of when you see Jesus for the first time or something. And it had like the normal one who goes up and gives him a hug. Had, and these are all little clips from the show The Chosen, which I haven't watched all of, but I watched some of it. And, you know, you got some that come up and just hug them, others that, you know, like violently hug them, others that just break down crying, others that are just, they're just all, all the range of emotions. And, of course, they're playing the song I can only imagine in the background. It was just an incredibly powerful um, video. And, and when you think about finally seeing this man that you spent your whole life hoping to see one day and doing your best to live for and tell other people about and you come to church I mean, that's, that's the, that's, he, he is literally the reason why we're all sitting in these pews today. Yeah. If there was no Jesus, there would be none of us here. We would all be doing every, any, anything and everything else. And so one day when, we, when faith gives way to sight and we get to see him, it will be incredible to almost, I, I think, involuntarily react in a way that we probably can't even anticipate. Yeah. It will just be instinctive. It'll be an explosion of emotion. Even for the, um, it reminds me of a video I watched. This guy was talking to some Presbyterians, and he wasn't Presbyterian, and he had to tell them. He was getting really passionate, and he said, look, that's emotion, and that's because I get emotional. And, I, and it, even for the Presbyterian or the most stoic of us among us, you know, I think there'll be some emotion. There'll be nobody, I mean, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious here now, but I think there'll be no one who sees Jesus for the first time and grants him a handshake, you know, in the most modest and mild manner. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be like that, you know. I just don't think so. And if you do, once you shake his hand and you feel the nail print in his hand, it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch you in a, in a way you've never been touched before. Uh, uh, so it says that they had uh, fell down and worshipped him. Um, then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a lar large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep, which is hilarious because that was exactly what they were worried about in the first place and what they tried to guard against, and now they're paying this, these people to go and spread that lie. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, we know that Mark, Luke, and John also give accounts of Jesus' resurrection with various details. You can corroborate those details, and you can harmonize them all. The, the fact of the matter is that all of them told the story from their own vantage point, but they told the same story, which is that Jesus did die, but that he did come back to life. He rose from the dead. It's, again, it's inseparable from the story of the gospel itself. And so... Is resurrection real? Well, yeah, if you're going if, if, if to be true to the central message of Christianity itself, you have to say that the resurrection is real. When the apostles went out, as Jesus had told them to, to go and preach, it says in Acts 1.8 and then also in verse um, 22, one of the things Jesus had said when he, after he rose from the dead and had seen his disciples, he said this, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, witnesses to what? Or witnesses of what? Well, when Jesus leaves and ascends into heaven, and the apostles are sitting around, and they're waiting, and they're praying, they decide they're going to replace Judas with another apostle. And one of the qualifications, and one of the things they say in verse 22, is that um, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, he says, for one of these, meaning one of these candidates, one of these people that are going to be an apostle alongside us, he says, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That's what they were witnesses to. They were witnesses to and of his resurrection. One of the ways that the summary, uh, that their ministry was summarized in chapter 4, verse 33, is in this way. It says, with great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's what they testified of, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Lastly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where we were at before, just again, to make this point that this is an, in, uh, an inseparable part of the message of the gospel, it says in verse 12, If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, in the uh, case of the Corinthian church, they were not just doubting Jesus' resurrection. Again, they were doubting resurrection as a whole. Paul's going to get around to explaining to them that they themselves will be resurrected one day, but if, if you just doubt resurrection as a whole, well, you can't, make an exception for, well, there was this one time that Jesus raised from the dead and he ascended into heaven. No, if you think that resurrection cannot happen, well, then that means Jesus could not have raised. And so, so then it's all, you have to throw it all out. You have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Verse 13 says, if there is no resurrection, you can't make it any more clear. If there is no resurrection at all of the dead, well, then not even Christ has been raised. This Imagine somebody who's a Christian. You know, there's all types of Christians. What, 55,000 or whatever denominations of Christians that all have uh, different varying distinctives. Some believe in this and some believe in that. But there are some things that you can't dispense with and still be Christian, and the resurrection is one of them. Imagine somebody saying they're a Christian because they love believers and because uh, they love going to church and because they have sing, sang hymn songs their whole life and they love the hymns and because they pray, and because they fast, and because they evangelize. But what they can't bring themselves to believe in is that there's a resurrection, because we know better than that, because, because science has showed us that people don't raise back from the dead. Don't you see how bodies break down over time? Don't you, I mean, what about, what about all the different ways that people do die? How could God ever resurrect that? So I'm not sure about that part. Well, Paul says, if you want to dispense with resurrection, you dispense with Christ himself. You're not talking about Christianity. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. You can't dispense with that. Last one. For if the dead are not raised, in verse 16, then Christ has not been raised either. Plain and simple, black and white, clear as day. I'm a very gray type of dude. I think I talked to Josh about this recently. I am the first one to tell you that life is very gray. And so a lot of times when I explain things, I'll say, yeah, I could see that, but I could also see this, and I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, and we need to use a lot of wisdom. And yeah, this resurrection is not a gray issue. This is, a, this is one of the black and white issues. 
either resurrection is true and Jesus is uh, the firstborn of the dead, as it says in Colossians, or resurrection is not true, in which case Jesus also didn't raise. And then there's all kinds of des- uh, 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 discouraging consequences that come from that, like your faith is in vain, like Paul's preaching is in vain, like there is no hope beyond this life. And so you may as well eat, drink, and be merry. The resurrection is a fact. It's a fact. Resurrection itself in general is a fact. It can happen and will happen. It has happened. Now we'll talk specifically about Jesus' resurrection. Resurrection is real, and specifically Jesus' resurrection is real and true. But is Jesus' resurrection relevant? Just like on Good Friday, and as well as what we just read in um, Matthew 27 and 28, there is the fact of what happened that we can just talk about as history, as something that has occurred, as an event, but then there's the meaning of it. And that's what it really comes down to. I mean, it's been said before, so Jesus rose from the dead. So what? So did Lazarus. So did that one little boy that Jesus rose from the uh, you know, resurrected. So, so what? I mean, it's not like Jesus is the only person to ever come back from the dead. Okay, granted. But Jesus is in a category all his own. Matthew, cha- or, sorry, Mark chapter 12, verse 26 to 27 will give you one idea of the implication of Jesus' resurrection. I think I read this earlier, didn't I? Yeah. Remember when I read this earlier, it says, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You remember that point? Well, just to put an emphasis, in verse 27, he says, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So the point here is that Jesus' resurrection and resurrection even in general, but specifically Jesus' resurrection, shows that the God that we claim to worship is a God who resurrects the dead. This is is the, the, the power that that involves, the involvement and the closeness of God that that involves. That is all characteristic of the God that we worship. And so if you understand God in a way that 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 doesn't account for him resurrecting people, then that's not the God of the Bible. He is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. In Romans 4, 24 and 45, I read this on Friday, uh, and if you were paying attention as I was reading through there on Friday, you would have noticed that, man, Michael's making a big deal about Jesus' death, but it also mentions Jesus' resurrection here a little bit, too. I know, but I was just, you know, you only preach one sermon at a time, all right? (laughs) Romans chapter 4, verse 24 says this, and remember, this is Paul explaining that in the same way that Abraham was justified by faith, now Christians, people today, are justified by faith in a similar fashion. And so in verse 23, it says, The words, it was credited to him, referring to Abraham as righteousness, were not written for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, which is a blessed truth to have righteousness credited to us, even though in factuality we're guilty, we have righteousness credited to us. But to who? Who's the us? Look at this but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe what? Who believe what? Who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. You see how God is the God of resurrection? The God that we believe in is one that we believe can resurrect the dead. This is the same God that Abraham believed in when he went to go sacrifice his son, believing that if God needed to, God could raise him from the dead. That's the same God. So we believe in a God who resurrects. So is Jesus' resurrection relevant? Well, yeah, because it displays that the God that we worship is the God who resurrects. He's a God who brings life even from non-life, life life even from death. He was delivered over to uh, to death for for our sins, and that was the emphasis on Friday, but also was raised to life for our justification. So first of all, it's relevant because he, it shows us that God is, the God we believe in is the God of resurrection. Secondly, Jesus' resurrection speaks to the extent of his work. If you happen to turn to Romans 4, you can just look right over to Romans 5. Verse 9 to 10, it says this. Since we have now been justified by his blood, again, this is hearkening back to Friday if you were here, but we're going to look at now the resurrection side of it. 
since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more, how much more, as if anything more could be said after being justified by the blood of the Son of God? How, what can you add to that? How can there be much more than that? How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, now this is just explaining further what was stated in verse 9, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, that's through his blood, that's through his death, that's what it says, right? If while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, that's already done, it's past as well as current, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be yet future, saved through his life? How will we, how will we see, we've been, we've been justified by blood, the blood of the Son of God, in the past. It's already done. His work is done. We've apprehended that by faith, just like Abraham did, and so it's current, currently applied. So what's left to be done? Well, this is going to bleed into a point I'm going to make um, I think my fourth point. But in the fact that there is such a thing as the wrath of God that is coming upon the world in the future. It's coming. But praise God as a saint that we can be saved from that as well. We've been saved and are currently saved and will be saved from that wrath as well. And how is that done? By his life. By his life. And that is no doubt his resurrection life. It's the fact that even in his resurrected state, he's interceding on behalf of the saints, continuously working. He will complete what he started in his people so that it can be said that we can be saved even from the wrath that is to come. And the confidence for that actually comes from the, confident, uh, comes from the work he's already done for us on our behalf. That is to say that if you want confidence in the future judgment that's coming and standing before the Lord and not crumbling before his wrath, then stake everything that you have in the finished work of Christ that's already been done. Because since we're justified, that was the basis that Paul said, since we're justified, then how much more so can we be sure that he's going to do what he said in the future since he's, based on what he's already done? There's a parallel to this passage because Romans 5 through 8 is uh, mostly about hope. And he talks about the law. He talks about, uh, he talks about um, dying with Christ and living with him, so living as a Christian. He talks about some different themes in there. But sort of a pinnacle theme is the idea of hope. And in chapter 8, there's a parallel passage to what we read in chapter 5, verses 18 to 25. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I love Paul's confidence. He always talks about the future when he's talking to saints as if there's just no doubt, which is why a pet peeve of mine is to have a, a not, not a healthy self-awareness, that's not what I'm talking about, but a... Uh, a plague of paranoia that God is after us and we were just, we're always squeaking by by the hair on our chinny chin chin. And it just seems like Paul doesn't speak in such a way when he says, when he says what God is going to do in the future because he's so sure of what Jesus has done already in the past. But verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship as if we haven't been adopted as God's children yet but we know we have in a sense but there's still more to come right this adoption to sonship that he's referring to here is the next phrase the redemption of our bodies and he says this for in this hope we were saved 
In this hope, we were saved. I'm really good at repeating myself, and I'll try not to, but just remember what I said about the connection between Jesus and what he's done for us, and then what that means for sealing our future. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they, have already, what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And that's our posture at the current time. Is Jesus' resurrection relevant? Well, yeah, because it tells us the God that we uh, serve as a God of resurrection. It also shows the extent of his work, that Jesus' death not only justifies us now, but secures a blessed future. Next, it should motivate us. This is all passive stuff so far. This is all telling, you know, of what Jesus has done for us and what we have coming to us, which is all kind of passive. It can lead, you to, it can lead one to think, well, what am I supposed to do about that now? It's really nice to know that, as we just read, we're waiting patiently. But that sounds extremely passive. Now, I intentionally will preach what's called the indicatives, you know, what, uh, what Jesus has done, because... It seems to me that in the New Testament, that's what the apostles do. And it is from that that you find the motivation that can carry you into the actions. You can preach the actions all you want. I can just come up here and say, have faith, have faith, have faith, have faith. And then ask Aragon for some examples of some illustrations because I can't come up with them. And, make, and, then, and then do something clever and just tell you, have faith and pray and read and do the stuff. I, I mean, I could do that, you know, and just be like and beat you with that. And there's a place for that when you just need to be told, you know, buck up. But really what we need more so is what to have faith in. We need to be reminded of what he did, who he is, who we are in him, what he says of us, what he's, got, what he's, what he's, what he's offering to us. We need to be reminded of those things and then engage our life and wrap our life around those things in such a way that it's revolutionized. So now we see that the resurrection is relevant because it does lead to motivation to work hard in light of the resurrection day. And for that, we get 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30 to 32. All of chapter 15 is dealing with the resurrection in general, and then the resurrection of Christ, and then the resurrection of his saints. Verse 30 and 32, this is, uh, this is what Paul says to the church. He says, And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? You know, Paul lived a really risky life. He lived an adventurous, but a tense uh, and, and dangerous life. So he says, why do I do this? Why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Verse 31, I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's not hyperbole. He had been beaten, and he had started riots, and he had been imprisoned, and he had been slandered, and he had had plots against him to meet him as he was traveling from one place to another, and then had the word come back to him that there was a hit out on him, so then he had to find a different way to go. That was Paul's life, and he's telling the Corinthians, as he's trying to get them to believe in the resurrection, why do you think I'm doing what I'm doing? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, then what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Not to state this too boldly, but what we do in this life matters for eternity. Now, if you really think about that, you can't live under that weight. I mean, I, I really don't, I don't, I mean, you have to, but the more you think about it, you can't quantify eternity and then try to link that to how I speak to my wife. But the two are connected. Somehow, some way, by God's grace, and if we just have to simply plead out to him in prayer, we have to ask him to see our lives in light of eternity. So at the end of chapter 15, verse 58, after he explains everything about the resurrection, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. He had told them earlier, stop sinning. He, he doesn't want them to drift away from the conviction they once had in the resurrection of Christ and the hope of resurrection for themselves. So he says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Then he says this, and this is what I'd say to you, saints, as I even say it to myself. 
Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Have you ever uh, imagined the fact that, for example, I'll use myself as an example. I'm taking five days of vacation leave off uh, from work. You know, we have a limited amount of time, and I was trying to plan out how am I going to use these days. Well, one, one week, you know, five-day break, will be uh, to attend VBS. And uh, it's easy in my haste, you know, in my haste, as I think quickly about it, and I feel just obligated, i got to be here, obviously, you know, to help with that and all that, that if I didn't have to do that, I could have taken leave out of football camp, or I could have this or that. Or I could save up my leave and then take a month off, you know, like in a couple years or whatever, you know. Um, but if I slow down and think of what's actually happening at VBS, the fact that we're, we're going to tell the good news of Jesus to some kids, and one of these kids might believe it. And even if a kid doesn't believe it, but they heard it so that next time they're familiar with it, or maybe 15 years from now after they've been through some things, and they say, oh, I remember that one church I went to, and that one guy said this, and I, just, I don't know. Where I'm at in life, all I know is I need a Bible because I remember VB. When you think about that, and then you think in light of eternity, that maybe that kid may grow up to be a full, full, full grown adult and then end up on the good side of eternity rather than the bad side of eternity. A five day break and not taking my son to football camp or something is really not that big of a sacrifice. And Paul says here, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. So, that, it behooves us to ask ourselves, what is the work of the Lord, and how could I be involved in that on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, with my free time? I mean, we all need breaks and free time and leisure, of course. And this isn't to, to discourage that. But it is to speak just what the Word says here. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Sometimes it seems like a menial task. I mean, you, you brought cookies on Friday for the Good Friday service. But without that, I doubt that people would have stuck around as long as they did and maybe mingled and maybe got to know another believer and been encouraged in their faith in some way. So it seemed like, dang it, I have to go get cookies again. I forgot to bake and I got to, I mean, it seemed like just that, but maybe there's something bigger to that. We're thinking in light of eternity at all times. But only if there's a resurrection day. Lastly, resurrection is relevant because it shows us we serve a God of resurrection. It shows the extent of Jesus' work. It motivates us to work hard in light of the resurrection day. And as a sub-point to the fact that there's a resurrection day uh, and that we should work hard and that what we do in this life affects eternity, we need to remember that Jesus, who is the resurrected Lord, is the resurrected judge. He'll be the one that will say, well done, good and faithful servant, or... Depart from me, I never knew you. So here's a, a point of trivia as I find the passage. There's not 42 verses in Romans chapter 10. <laughs> but there is in Acts chapter 10. This is Peter speaking. Peter speaks to Jesus and says, He commanded us to preach to the people... And to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. You know, if Jesus is dead, he doesn't make for a very good judge. He's alive. He'll serve in the role of judge one day. In chapter 17, verse 31, this is very interesting. I heard James White point this out, and so I, I grabbed it from him. I just, I mean, it's the scripture that says it, but I didn't, I, I didn't recognize this. He had pointed out the fact that as an apologist, he's always trying to, you know, you find yourself trying to defend the fact the resurrection happened. But in this case, uh, uh, Paul actually uses resurrection as evidence of something else, which is kind of weird. Chapter 17, verse 31 says this, For he has set a day... When he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And it says this, he has given proof of this, of what? Well, that there will be a day of justice that he will be the judge of. 
It says he's given proof to this, of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The fact that Jesus is the one that God appointed and, and raised from the dead actually serves as a proof that he is also the one that God has handed over the right of judgment to. And so, in summary, number one, resurrection is real. Our God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Secondly, Jesus' resurrection is relevant in that he is the living judge. Our labor will have eternal significance at the resurrection, and also he is working even now. He's alive. He's not a dead God. He's alive, well, and working, present, even in your life, even in our church, even through our lives in our church. And I pray that he'd do that even more effectively, and we would cooperate with that and abound in the work of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the fact that we get to gather together again and be reminded of just a basic truth, but a most fundamental, elementary, but uh, powerful truth, that Jesus is alive today. He's alive and he's active. We're accountable to him. We're followers of him. We're worshipers of him. We're saved by him. We're lovers of him. We're eager to see him one day. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, and we will need help continually for the rest of our life to live in light of the fact that the Lord Jesus has been resurrected. And we will follow suit one day. By the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, we will be resurrected from the dead. Thank you that you're able to cause us to stand on that day. Thank you for the fact that even though you that that you have even though we get in the way of what you're working in our life, that Lord, we really can't stay your hand, but that you will accomplish what you set out to accomplish. And Lord, we want to give ourselves more fully in our most menial tasks, even into our most important tasks, to the work of the Lord in light of the coming resurrection day. In Jesus' name, amen.